If you would like our free newsletters on various religious topics, just send us an email at cdebater at aol.com and free newsletters will be sent to you by mail. Just provide your postal address in your email. The following are samples of some of the newsletters we have available. Does God Believe in Atheists? Part 1 Seventh-day Adventism, True or False? The Agony of Deceit The Origins of Muhammad's Religion Spiritual Warfare Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. From Tradition to Truth, a Priest's Story. An Evaluation of the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Mormonism, Counterfeit Christianity. Turn or Burn. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Links to these newsletters can also be found at our website www.biblequery.org Once on the home page, simply click on the menu icon at the upper left hand corner. Then click on the newsletters button. Feel free to print them out. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Once again to our program, I'm Larry Wessels, your host. I'm Director of Christian Answers. I want to thank you for being here today. I'm with my very special guest, my friend, and my brother in Christ, and our Director of Christian Answers of Research, Steve Morrison. He's got thank a lot of titles. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Steve, we're, as usual, I like to take advantage of your expertise on uh, early church history and things of that nature. There's not many people in your class that know what you know on early church history. Mainly, I think, because most people do this oh, when it comes to... And then open those dusty old books and actually mm -hmm. read them all. And, and you're, you have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. When most people don't, it, it puts you in a class by yourself. So we're going to do another show on early church history. And we're going to uh, cover the topic of uh, why Catholics don't need a Pope. Uh, but before we do that, like I always do when you're on, and to prove to people that you really do know early church history, uh, go ahead and give us your websites that you're the webmaster of. Okay, uh, first website is www.biblequery.org. It answers over 9,100 questions on the Bible. It has, uh, I'm not sure how many web pages, maybe 120 plus on early church history and what four or more early Christians taught and undenied. Um, also have a second website, www.muslimhope.com, uh, that, that shows what early Islam uh, taught and practiced and to help Muslims see the real uh, hope they have when they leave Islam and find the real Jesus. Then a third website, www.historycard.com, uh, that pulls the historical information from the first two websites. So if you just want to study like the historical background and, and things like that, that's all there. All right, outstanding. And of course, I want to remind our viewers that uh, we have 19 playlists on our YouTube channel, C Answers TV. But one of those playlists, and you're looking at it on your screen right now, is a playlist called Dealing with Anti-Trinitarians, like UPC, and early church history. And you're going to find Steve all over the place in that particular playlist. And in fact, you can see his face on some of those videos right there on the playlist, just the first few videos, but it's just a whole bunch of them. 
that you're not looking at. But uh, I would suggest that you check out that playlist uh, by clicking on the title above. It'll take you to all the videos that are in that playlist. And we have quite a few by Steve on early church history, along with him uh, doing a four-hour debate with the Oneness Pentecostal and uh, other subjects. So uh, just want to get that little plug in for some of your videos, Steve. Because <laughs> that's the playlist where you... Uh, you really hang out a lot in. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that said, we want to cover a topic here today on why Catholics don't need a Pope. Okay. So I'm going to throw the floor open to you. You've done your research as usual, and I'd now like you to share that with our viewing audience. Okay. So first of all, this is not a video on early church history, but this is applying early church history uh, to the qu question about do Catholics really need a Pope? And um, in preparation for this, I've, I've read cover to cover uh, five books uh, by Catholic apologist P Carl Keating. Could you mind uh, just showing which, what those five books are? Uh, the, the Francis Feud, which uh, frankly I found most fascinating. I didn't know so much about Pope Francis till I read some of the stuff. Uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, which is a pretty thick book, has a lot of stuff. Debating Catholics, which are um, debate cran uh, uh, transcripts or editor to debate transcripts between Carl Keating and some sometimes interesting people like uh, Ruckman, who believes in King James only, um, uh, Philippine, um, I would call heresy or cult, Iglesia Ne Cristo, um, that denies that the, uh, Christ is, is, denies the Trinity, and Ke Keating debated them and some others. Um, the Usual Suspects, uh, what Catholics really believe, a little more basic book, and then, uh, and, and, and then to, to get a um, kind of a, a little different perspective, um, uh, Peter Kreeft, um, his, uh, he comes at Roman Catholicism a little different than Keating, but it's kind of compatible with it. And then uh, another book um, that's a rather different perspective, Why I'm Catholic uh, by Gary Wills. And um, this is uh, maybe disagree with Keating on some points. Um, so, but most of this is going to be um, uh, kind of, from, sorry, uh, Catholicism from the perspective of Carl Ke uh, Keating, and I'll point out places to where it's not. Now, Carl Keating is the founder of uh, an organization called Catholic Answers, is that right. not right? Right. And uh, what do, you, do you have anything to say about Catholic Answers? They're an apologetic organization defending Roman Catholicism. Right. right. Well, I'll say a little bit about them later, but it's kind of like they're doing things on two sides. One side, which you may be more familiar with, is um, they try to say how Catholicism is right uh, compared to fundamentalism. Uh, or, or Protestantism, but then they have another side too in which they're defending Catholicism kind of from Catholics uh, <laughs> because there, there are Catholics who are called set of vacantists who believe yes. that um, there are, there, the Pope today is an illegitimate Pope and some previous Popes recently have been illegitimate and they, um, you, you know, kind of are down on that and there are others that are pretty Catholics who are pretty down on certain aspects of Catholicism. This reminds me of a former Catholic answer spokesman, Jerry Matatix, who is a set of Vaticanists. Yes, and, 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 and Keating and, uh, and actually uh, mentions that in, his, right, in his book. Right. So, so, so he's kind of got to handle two sides there. That's right. you got the Diamond Brothers, that most holy monastery that they run against modern Catholicism. Yeah. See, and, uh, it is interesting to note, and I'll mention it to our viewers in case you want to check out the video. We have a video where our ministry is pitted against Catholic Answers. And so just look on our Roman Catholic playlist, which has over 187 videos. Uh, look for Christian Answers versus Catholic Answers. Or either, at this moment, either it's uh, Catholic Answers versus Christian Answers. But mm -hmm. anyway, it's their ministry name versus our ministry name. And we have uh, Dr. James White representing our ministry versus uh, Jimmy Aiken of Catholic Answers. So mm -hmm. our ministries have actually had, had loggerheads in a debate, an actual okay. uh, moderated debate. So that's for anyone to check out. But you're basically dealing with uh, 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 Carl Keating here with Catholic Answers. And so with that, go ahead. Okay, so we, we, we're going to give you a little bit of an inter, inter, introduction about um, Carl Keating and a little bit of what he said in his books. Um, and, and then we're, we're going to jump into um, uh, six different points about why Catholics don't need a pope. 
Uh, just at a high level, the basic argument is there are ugly, wicked results of the papacy. There is no excuse for Christian leaders to do these things. Just saying if it's not ex cathedra, it's okay, it doesn't fly. Uh, papal succession didn't do anything, well, at least not anything good. Uh, other churches did better without a Roman pope. Possible pope replacements, we'll explore some stuff. And then exactly where do we go from here? Now, it looks like you end up with a word there based on what you just said called unpope. Yeah, and that's uh, my suggestion. If you really want to follow Christ closer, um, you need to cast away things that might get in the way, and one of them can be the popes. In other words, cast away your idols. If, if the pope is an idol, yes. Uh, it, but, but if the pope isn't an idol, but he's just teaching you wrong things, well, cast should, him away anyway. Well, yeah, because then he's a false prophet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. Just to give an introduction, we are evangelicals who are uh, uh, Christian apologists, so we defend the Christian faith. Just to say that there are many kinds of Catholics historically, we'll talk a little bit about that. And today there are different types of Catholics. We'll talk a little about Carl Keating, talk a little about his five books. And these videos are kind of partially in an answer to his books. And then we'll talk about Protestants versus Evangelicals versus Fundamentalists um, that Keating picks up. A few little mistakes, but much of what he says is correct there. So jumping into uh, our background, uh, we are, uh, there's a difference between Evangelicals and Fundamentalists. And Keating goes in his books, he's pretty much against Fundamentalists. Okay, and he talks about some that are uh, professional anti-Catholics, you know, well, anti-Catholic mainly, and then also professionals. And let me just say that we are not professionals. Uh, we have regular um, full-time, you know, secular jobs. Uh, we're not anti-Catholics in that we focus on uh, other stuff in addition to Catholicism. We're not, we don't shy away from talking about Catholicism, but out of like 760 videos, we have about 187 or so on Roman Catholicism, but 573 on other topics. In a sense, when, when Keating uh, you know, says how the fundamentalists are wrong, we're kind of bystanders because we aren't fundamentalists, we are evangelicals. However, since our beliefs are similar enough to fundamentalists, in a way we're not bystanders. So we affirm that a person can be a Catholic and go to heaven, and we know of evangelical Catholics and believe they are believers. Um, however, for other people, Catholicism has been a barrier to accepting Christianity. And it, I guess my feeling in doing this research is I felt like I was like transported a thousand years ago trying to argue uh, from a government perspective that you don't have to have a king to survive. You know, most nations today uh, don't have an emperor and they do okay. And it's like you don't have to have a human kind of like emperor, you know, of, of a church um, to have a good church. Um, you know, our only king, you know, needs to be his Christ. So anyway, uh, the, the, uh, let me say some things that Keating says that, uh, that, that, that we agree with. All right, so Keating, in his book, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 129, says he doesn't believe that God gave the Bible my mechanical dictation. We completely agree. Again, maybe some fundamentalists might not, but we believe that God, um, the different books of the Bible show the personality of the human author, and of course God shows the human authors too, but uh, we don't believe in mechanical dictation. All right, we believe that the Bible is inerrant in its original text. However, I think Keating might believe that, but I can't, couldn't really see in the five books where he really affirmed that or denied it. So I'm kind of guessing here that he believed that, but on that one I'm not so sure. And then uh, the popes and bishops were not inspired like the authors of scriptures were. We agree with that. That was in uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 146. Keating also says that Jesus is the ultimate head of the church. That one is in Debating Catholicism, uh, page 73. And we just got to say amen to that. So at least in that phrase, in that book, he, I think he got that right. Keating scorns uh, two libelous books against Catholicism. One's called The Two Babylons, and the other he's strongly against is the Babylon Mystery Religion. And this is in uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 219, 222, Debating Catholicism, page 47. 
And we agree, those are sorry books filled with inaccuracies and we don't think that they add anything to the discussion and Keating doesn't really either. One note on that is uh, I've done a lot of evangelism with Jehovah's Witnesses. One time I was in uh, a Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall mm -hmm. and I was purchasing some of their books so I could later use them against them in an apologetic uh, sense. But a major book they had on their bookshelf inside the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall was the two Babylons. Oh, really? <laughs> so, okay. So, so I didn't know Jehovah's Witnesses so, were so big on that. Yeah, they are. And uh, because I've always told people, if you're going to do apologetics, Christian apologetics, learn how to refute Jehovah's Witnesses because they get almost everything wrong. On all the key doctrines of Christianity. You're kind of saying they're kind of an easy target. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> okay. and if you want to learn how to do apologetics, just learn how to, re to re refute them. Then you're good for almost any other false religion out there. They may not have everything. That you, but these guys get almost everything wrong. So you're okay. prepared for all the other false prophets. But anyway, go ahead. All right. So, so Keating basically, in, to put words in his mouth, <laughs> says these two words are full of junk. These two books are full of junk. And we agree with Keating on this point. Okay, and uh, he also mentions another book uh, uh, by Lorraine Boatner called Roman Catholicism, uh, and he says that that has a lot of mistakes. Uh, let me just say where we're coming from. I never even heard of that book. I don't know, after all the mistakes he's brought up in it, I'm not sure I, I want to read that book. So we're not based upon that at all. Uh, he said a lot of Reformed uh, anti-Catholicism, the way he puts it, comes from that book. Well, we don't. <laughs> uh, at least I, I, I hadn't read it. All right, so moving on, uh, historically, there have been many different kinds of, of, of Catholics, uh, at least what Catholics would call Catholics. Um, Origen was this really uh, strange teacher. Uh, he died about 254 AD. Uh, later on, he was declared a heretic for 553 AD. And I have to say, maybe for some, you know, the, the, there are some valid reasons there. He believed that everybody will eventually go to heaven, even de the devil and, and, and demons, which is non-biblical. However, I have to point out that many Christians after Nicaea and some before Nicaea were called Origenists because they respected and followed Origen so much. And that's unfortunate, but that is true. And there were some, uh, like Methodius, that, that pointed out Origen's errors and said, don't follow him. But um, so that's kind of like a big tent when we talk about historical Catholicism, and is my only point. Another was Monothelites in, um, in 625 to 680 AD. They were trying to be kind of a, a compromise between the Monophysites, like the Copts of Egypt, and the Orthodox uh, 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 view, you know, or, or, or Chalcedonian view. They were later declared heretics, uh, somewhat later, even though a pope kind of didn't um, oppose them at one point. So that's kind of big. Uh, iconoclasm started with uh, Emperor Leo III. Um, it uh, said that we shouldn't have images uh, or icons, you know, you just pray to God. And Keating calls this a heresy. Uh, in Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 41. So he's pretty strong about that, but he would call these people Catholics, I guess. Uh, Blaise Pascal was a Jansenist, which is sort of a Calvinistic Catholic. That was called a heresy. And at times there were two and even three competing popes that all claimed to be successors of Peter at the same time and, you know, were against the others. Uh, uh, yeah, at the time we're videotaping this, there's actually two living popes. One one is retired, but the other one's active. Yeah, two living Roman Catholics. But 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 these were all active popes. So the Catholics call the ones that they deem not official anti popes. And another thing is that uh, the Albigensians and or also Cathars, they were ex Catholic heretics. They had a bunch of very heretical teachings. Keating, uh, on one hand, says that, you know, they were wrong, they were heretics. Uh, we would agree that the Cathar teachings are heretical. On the other hand, you know, Catholics say, well, you know, because the Catholic Church, you know, we don't have all these splits and divisions and we keep the one faith. Well, the way they kept the one faith is by massacring the Albigensians. So isn't the cure worse than the disease, maybe? Um you know, that, that you kill all the men, women, and children in entire towns uh, because they're, that you call them heretics, and actually they were heretics, but maybe they should be reasoned with, but uh, not killed. 
So, yeah, it doesn't really impress me to say, well, you kept the church together by killing the people who disagreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So today, uh, one thing I've kind of learned from Keating is there's still many different kinds of Catholics. There are what are called reactionary and traditionalist Catholics. They're kind of either grudgingly would say the Mass in the local language, or they would refuse that and say, no, it has to be in Latin. You know, we talked about Ruckman, who says, you know, the King James is kind of like, you know, God's language and God's Bible. Well, well, these we've guys... actually got a video on him on our YouTube channel called The Cult of Ruckmanism. Okay. And but, so if anyone wants to know more about him, check out our video. Yeah, my point was saying that <clears throat> since he kind of says that about King James, well, <clears throat> these Catholics say the same thing kind of about Latin. Now, th these are a minority of Catholics, but they are out there uh, and have that. <clears throat> then you have the ultramontanists and the neo ultramontanists and these are the people who kind of <clears throat> say the pope is is the most important part what he says goes and the popes can all and never be wrong or almost never be wrong <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, when they speak officially and um and keating it is um kind of against these guys and we had at least two hours of video showing how the we've had so many bad popes it's not six or seven bad popes like keating claims it's at least more than 46 bad popes. There's so many bad popes that video lasted almost two hours. Yeah, it, it, it kind of get lost <laughs> counting a little bit. Uh, and then you have other Catholics, and these might be a majority of uh, Catholics in America. These are modernists and neo-Catholics, and they say things like, um, the Pope should allow birth control. The Pope should allow couples living together who aren't married to take communion. A few of them say we should be able to have women priests. We should be able to have lesbian, uh, a, 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 a gay and, 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 and lesbian people in the church. So the popes have been against that, but they're neo-modernists who are trying to push for that and kind of putting pressure on popes for that. Then you have a set of vacantists. Uh, one example is uh, Jerry uh, Matitix. Another is named Mario Dirksen. They say that the current popes are illegitimate. They are kind of like the um, reactionists plus... I guess you'd say, and they say the Catholic Church doesn't have a Pope today, a valid one. What's interesting is uh, our YouTube channel has uh, a, some several debates with Jerry Matitix when he was still representing Catholic Answers before right. this. Right, and uh, it, there, you can find them on our channel if you look for them. Yeah. Uh, so it, and then we also covered the you know what he's into now in another video. Uh, starts out calling, uh, called the, with Rob Zins and myself, mm -hmm. who's a, a former uh, Roman Catholic and an apologist for uh, against Romanism these days. But in that video, it, start, it's, it, it starts with the title, The Homosexual Pope, because one of their popes was homosexual. But anyway, go ahead. Right. And then finally, you have other Catholics that are kind of remind me of liberal Protestants. Hans Kung, uh, Edward Skillebex, and later Karl Rahner, not early in his career though, uh, they did not affirm Jesus physically rose from the dead. Keating, you know, doesn't accept them. And just kind of looking at a few things like um, what Hans Kung, who was uh, very uh, positive toward the uh, current Pope, Pope Francis, he wrote a book called Infallible and Inquiry. And according to Hans Kung, who is a Catholic theology professor, and I need to put an X in there somewhere, but I'm not really sure where. Because he's still considered a Catholic. He was basically not allowed to speak from his chair at the university. So the University of Tübingen made another chair for him. So he still teaches theology, and he's still a professor. But he was kind of like let go of his uh, Roman Catholic sponsor position. So I'm not really sure what you would call that. But anyway, he said, according to Hans Kung, papal infallibility, he contended, was a doctrine that made it so hard for the Catholic Church to admit and correct its mistakes. Instead, Kung proposed that the Church should claim the term indefectibility, <laughs> that despite all errors, it would always may be maintained by the Spirit and truth. Okay, so that's not papal infallibility at all, nor does it claim to be. So we have Catholics who are saying that. And he has expressed joy at Pope Francis's very different style. He felt able to add a second affirmative tier to the title of his English edition, We Can Save the Catholic Church. And this is from the website, https colon slash slash www.ncronline.org slash news slash people slash ripples dash spread dash out dash Hans dash K dash NGS dash work. 
So there's a lot of variety in Roman Catholicism today, a lot more than I expected. You know, at least if you hear the line about us all in church, they all kind of follow the same thing. All right. And Carl Keating, I will admit that many Catholics would not feel Keating and his group Catholic Answers represent their views. Mm-hmm. But others would agree with Keating. All right. Well, that's because uh, the Roman Catholic Church itself, as you just mentioned, is just such a mixed pot right. of just everything that that contradicts each other. Modernists mm-hmm. in there with more fundamental types. Uh, the, right. The, and it's just a mixed bag of just all kinds of stuff. So I, I'm not going to make any attempt to try to guess how many people would agree with Carl Keating, how many Catholics would disagree with Carl, with Carl Keating. <clears throat> but let me just acknowledge that a lot of the stuff in here is from the perspective of Carl Keating. Mm-hmm. So if you're a Catholic and you don't agree with some of these things I say about you know Catholics, it may be because you're just not agreeing with Carl Keating. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, you know, we acknowledge that. So a little bit about Carl Keating. He was a Roman Catholic apologetics ministry, and, and he founded Catholic Answers. On one hand, they're against fundamentalists and kind of implicitly against evangelicals because we believe so similar. Um, And there are many Catholic websites that I'm surprised that say the current Roman Catholic Church has lost its way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Many of them are really, really down on the current Pope, Pope Francis. And Carl Keating uh, mentions this. We're only going to go through, uh, in the Francis feud, we're only going to go through brief things on this, not really give it uh, full treatment it deserves. But... There are some fascinating points he, he makes in there. And about 13%, according to the Pew Institute, of all Americans are ex-Catholic. And so uh, lots of people are leaving the Catholic Church. Another thing the Pew Institute said is if you look at the de- declines in religious groups, uh, Catholicism is declining by a far greater percentage than others. <clears throat> and we don't know why. Is it because of all the pedophile priests? Is it because of the popes? Is it because of other reasons? Uh, you know, we, we don't necessarily know. I think it's a combination of a whole bunch of different reasons. Right. So. Um, but, but, but and, and I just feel in Keating's books that he's concerned about that. The other thing that, that he says is that many fundamentalists, in one place he estimates about a third and another, or a third to a majority of fundamentalists, are ex Catholics. So he sees that even though the typical Catholic would say there's no way that he, you would ever consider becoming a fundamentalist, a lot of Catholics do. And he always says how Catholics, uh, uh, you know, many Catholics are leaving for fundamentalism. And I would say to uh, raise my hand and tell Keenan, wait a second, give evangelicals some credit here too. Uh, a lot of them are, are going to evangelical churches. So, I mean, I teach a small Bible study of, uh, on, uh, of 10 men, and I was uh, surprised to find that three of them uh, had a, a, were, grew up in Catholic schools mm-hmm. and heard some interesting things. Like one guy said in 17 years, he never once heard John 3.16. Wow. You know, uh, and then uh, and one person in the Bible study who's still a Catholic and he's a, a you know, member of the Bible study in good standing. You know, a lot of the things it's like he wasn't against, he didn't have any argument about. It's like he just never heard before. Well, it's interesting because I did a video with ex-priest uh, Richard Bennett He's a Roman Catholic priest for 22 years. Mm -hmm. And then he went through some things, and he's got his testimony on this video I did with him. It's it's called uh, Roman Catholicism Denies Absolute Biblical Truth. But in that video, he was... I'm asking him, I'm going, wait a minute, you're a priest, you're doing all this study, and you're hanging out at the Vatican, all this stuff. Uh, Didn't you ever read Matthew 15 Mm -hmm. about the traditions of men supplanting the Word of God? And... He just looks at me in the video and says, no, we were always studying philosophy. But <laughs> so. Yeah, Gary Wilson talks about that some in his background. In He was trained to become a priest. He didn't actually become yeah, a priest. Yeah, yeah. Now, one thing I look for, reading through all five of Keating's books, I look for something to where he said that, or did he say, did a Catholic become an evangelical or a fundamentalist was that at least better than a Catholic becoming an atheist or agnostic? Didn't find a single sentence in all five of his books saying that. Mm. So so it's like, hmm. Uh, No comment, huh? Yeah. Now, I'll just tell you something about the five books, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. He kind of, um, the subtitle 
he feels like the attack on what he, in quotes, says Romanism. So he feels like under attack by fundamentalists. And it's not that, uh, I'm not a fundamentalist, but speaking for fundamentalists, is not that they're attacking Roman Catholics or they don't like Roman Catholic people. Uh, in one of the debates, even one of the, one of the fundamentalists said that he believes that you know some Roman Catholics can be genuinely saved. Um, it's just the barriers to the gospel that are put up by Roman Catholicism. That's what we're trying to remove. Okay, so uh, he feels, you know, I felt like he feels like he's under attack, but we are not attacking him. We're not attacking Roman Catholics. We're just saying you got some stuff here that's keeping you from the gospel. We need to get rid of it. You know, so, uh, <laughs> well, I've heard over and over again for decades that uh, a lot of uh, Protestants and the evangelicals said, well, Catholics that come out of Roman Catholicism do that not because of Roman Catholicism, but despite Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it's like you're saying, there's a block there that Romanism is trying to keep people from seeing what the true gospel is. Right. They, they, and they, some, they, some of these Catholics actually see the gospel despite all the hindrances. Right. So it's a block for many, not all, but many. Another thing is more basic book. Who is the first pope? And it says, like, a Jesus may appear the first pope. Which Bible verse is that? Uh, oh, not in the Bible. Okay, right. well, which early church, Christian prior to Nicaea mm -hmm. said that Jesus made Peter a pope? Mm -hmm. Having read every single page of Nicaea, uh, uh, writings up to 325 AD and, and having it uh, electronically to search on it, let me tell you where it says that, that Jesus made Peter the first pope. It is not there. And he couldn't prove it in any of his five books. No, it, 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 well, nobody can prove it because it's, it's not there. And if you want to try to give me any kind of, you know, author and book and verse, fine. I will look it up and I'll read it for myself. It ain't there. All right, so that's the basic lie. Uh, book after that is, is The Usual Suspects. And The Usual Suspects answers uh, what he calls basic arguments on various topics. Today, our topic is just about the Pope. So a lot of things are good to discuss, but we're going to have to save those for, uh, for other shows. Another one is debating Catholicism. I talked about this before, but some interesting things. Um, sometimes some of the people he debates, I kind of cringe of, on, on, on the, what they bring up. As, well, as he's debating good. a lot of non-Christian cultists. Is what he's doing. Yeah, and some guys are, you know, maybe not so bad, but, um, you know, so, so it's just kind of interesting to see the back and forth. It, it is an interesting book. Well, by the way, I, just for our viewers, I want to show this on camera. I did this in some of our other videos, but see, here's Steve's notes. He actually read these books, okay? He's not just skimming through them. He's making notes on every one of Carl Keating's things because he actually read he actually read well, the book. Well, some of my notes actually aren't in the front, too. Oh, really? You yeah, got more yeah. in the back? No, no right? more in other pages. Oh, but, oh but you're in, in the middle of the book. You know, I yeah. got a lot of my books exactly the same way. But I'm just showing the folks at home. And uh, just just look at all the notes. And particularly this one. I guess this is his main book of all. Just, just, just full of notes. I mean, he actually studied and read Keating's works. So we could do this presentation here today. So... Uh, Steve doesn't fool around. So I uh, also read uh, Peter Kreese, 40 Reasons I'm a Catholic. And uh, Peter, it's like, uh, how can I say this nicely? He's not so intellectual as Carl Keating. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> put that one. What, what Kreef contributed uh, to my understanding is a lot of the reasons that, that, that he said to become a Catholic. Uh, one of them is like because they have nice cathedrals. Uh, another is essentially because whenever they talk about exorcism or something, Hollywood always portrays a Catholic priest, so kind of for Hollywood. So a lot of his reasons are like emotional reasons, not logical reasons. Oh, of reasons. course, and it makes sense because I listened to him one night, an entire lecture to some big crowd that he was talking to, and he's into the occult. He's, mm -hmm. an, he's an occultist, and most of your... So an occultist Catholic. Which is yeah, kind of, yeah, which yeah. Is kind which of ma which makes sense. It makes sense because they're all just a big bag of mixed stuff in, okay. in Roman Catholicism. But in that lecture he gave, uh, if you know anything about occultism, he's very esoteric. Mm -hmm. And when you, so what you're saying about it here makes perfectly good sense. Okay. You're coming from an occultic point of view. But 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 uh, but a lot of what 
I think drives people to remain Catholics is they feel like, well, it's been tradition, it's what people believe for 2,000 years, which is false. Uh, the Pope's have never been wrong officially, which is totally false. And Keating actually admits and kind of gets into. Um, and it's just a feeling of, a uh, nice feeling of certainty, which I know a lot of people in um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and various cults kind of are attracted to that because of the sense of certainty. Yes. Now, as uh, evangelicals, what do we offer in terms of certainty? Well, we do and we don't. We offer certainty of, of what God said in his word. But then again, there are a lot of things to where you have to use your own uh, judgment. You know, you have to use your own wisdom that you've gotten from God's word. So we don't offer the degree of certainty of uh, some guy who can dictatorially say no tango dancing. Or, 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 That's or, or, what one or, of the Pope or, said. Uh, yeah, said or, no or, 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 or something like that. Um, so sorry, we don't have as much certainty, but sometimes there's kind of um, risk and faith and going on a limb sometimes mm -hmm. in, 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 in following God. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not really, I want certainty. It's really, it should be, I want Jesus. Yeah. You know? yeah. I want to follow the word of God as it's presented here. And Jesus himself said this was the word of God. Right. Over and over again throughout the scripture. we got several videos on that subject. When Keating talks about Protestants, um, he gets some things right and some things wrong. Um, but we're really not focusing on Keating so much as uh, why Catholics don't need a Pope. So let me just say some things that Keating says that I think are right. He says in, in Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 15, that not all Protestants are evangelicals. All right, personally, uh, my growing up was in a liberal Christian church, um, which uh, basically is kind of less orthodox than Catholicism. Um, so very unfortunately, <laughs> uh, Keating is correct here. By the way, we have two videos on liberal Christianity, mm -hmm. which you are a star in. Yeah. So you can check it on our YouTube channel. Okay. And then Keating also go, goes along to say, even evangelicals who call themselves Bible-believing Christians have differences. Um, yes, we do. We have differences on secondary matters. Uh, primary matters, you know, Jesus being born of a virgin, you know, being fully God and man, the Trinity, dying for our sins, all evangelicals are agreed upon, otherwise you're not an evangelical. Uh, but we do have differences over things like believer's baptism versus infant baptism, once saved, always saved, you can lose your salvation, the, the best way of doing church government, so on, on. And these matters are not trivial, but they're not things that you will lose your salvation over if you're wrong. And he talks about, you know, Baptist and Reformed. Of course, you can be Reformed Baptist also. Other fundamentalists, he talks about charismatics. And he mentions in um, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 11, that evangelicalism is kind of a spectrum. And I can kind of see his point here. On one end, you have people like Peter Ruckman and Christians who say no dancing, not tango dancing, but no <laughs> dancing in general, all drinking, you know, on one extreme. And then on the other extreme, you have evangelicals, sometimes called neo-evangelicals, that, for example, really, really like C.S. Lewis. And then you, you have a lot in between. And so he kind of, um, you know, says they're not all the same. And, and, and he also mentions that some of the people who feel he feels are more uh, concentrating against Catholicism or more of the fundamentalist. And he's probably right on that. I would like to say here, because uh, as you're rolling along on all this information, we just have so many videos on YouTube that usually tie into something you're mentioning. Okay. I wanted to say on evangelicals, uh, like you said at first, we don't concentrate just on uh, attacking Roman Catholicism. We don't. Maybe some right. fundamentalists do. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. We, we don't. don't. We don't. Uh, because we even have a video against evangelicals on our channel okay. where we show that according to... Pew Research and some other polls show that 87% of evangelicals don't know what the gospel is, mm -hmm. and they don't know what justification is. Okay. Now, that's 87% of people who call themselves evangelicals. Right, and, and, and I'm surprised at, at that higher percentage, but I guess basically as an evangelical, one problem with evangelicalism is it's gotten too popular. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and sometimes people want to call themselves it, without it, really knowing. It's become a, a tear field instead of a wheat field. Yeah, wheat and tares. <laughs> for the very reason you're you're mentioning here. Yeah. In fact, the uh, Southern Baptist Convention a few years back, I think he's got over 15 million members, said that only uh, what was it, 17 percent of their of their whole membership out of 15 million people even give any donations to the church. Wow. So what does that tell you about the? 
their numbers in that case. Yeah. So anyway. So going back to seeing where we are so we don't get lost here, we're going to know about why Catholics don't need a pope. And after the introduction, we're going to look at ugly, wicked results of the papacy, that there's no excuse for the Christian leaders to do these things. Papal succession didn't do anything good, at least. Other churches did better without a Roman pope, possible pope replacements, and exactly where to go from here. So now we are going to just very briefly, not in a lot of detail, um, touch on some of the wicked results of the papacy. And talking to a good um, Roman Catholic friend of mine who's a believer, um, he had never heard any of this uh, growing up. In, I'm not growing up, but, but in, in a Catholic church. And so a lot of Catholics, um, it's like they've never heard this information before. All right, so I'm just going to give you an overview for you to research on your own and a few little things. But all right, so I have seven points here. There's uh, probably a lot more than seven, but let's just stick with seven for now because we've got other stuff to go over. There are at least 19 Catholic persecutions of Jews. That's a lot. I don't think we should be persecuting anybody. But, I mean, the Jews were God's covenant people. There were multiple inquisitions, not just one. Spain, France, Portugal, Italy, all of Latin America. Uh, there were the Crusades and bloody persecution, against, including against fellow Christians in India, Italy, France, Spain, and Poland. Okay, The Papal States, which were city-states that would give tribute to the Pope because the Pope ruled them like a king and provide soldiers for his armies so that the Papal armies could fight France and Germany and Naples and Florence and other places. And we won't get into many details in this, but the gross amputation, rape, murder with Catholicism in the Americas among the Indians. And then in uh, U6, we had four, more than 46, at least 46 bad popes, including violence, nepotism, sexual immorality, bad teaching. Uh, and we actually have a whole couple hour video on this, on the bad popes. So we're just going to go lightly over this here. And then we're going to talk about another topic, popes on trial. So if a pope's on trial for heresy by another pope, that would tell me at least one of those two popes is really, really wrong. Mm -hmm. And I, I think if my memory serves me correct, you did most of the research, so I didn't have to, but it, it seems like one of the popes, or maybe even more than one, was dug up. So just because he wasn't held on trial for something, well, he, he, he was, could he, be he, dug he, up years later after he's dead and still be put on trial. Yes, and he was, he was put on trial. That was one pope, Pope for, uh, Formosus. Uh, by Stephen the Sixth, and um, that was yeah kind of gross, uh, <laughs> but 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 it's like either uh, Formosus or Stephen the Sixth was really bad <laughs> that you would have that, and actually in this case I would say I would go with Stephen the Sixth as the one being bad. You know that's the danger though because if you're a pope and you you die and you're celebrated in your funeral and everything buried. You can't be safe that you'll stay in that grave for the next few hundred years. You might get right. dug up. Right. And they cut off so. his, the corpse's fingers and then threw him in the river. Yeah. yeah. So for Catholic persecution of Jews, you can look at all the details on the website, www.biblequery.org. Other beliefs, all one word, slash Roman Catholicism, slash Catholic persecution of Jews, uh, either .html or, or, or .doc. And you can see all of them. And some of it was violent. Some of it was burning to death. A lot of it was economic, about what they could and couldn't own, what they had to wear, where they had to live. And it was just, how can I say this, not Christian. All right. And, the, and now it was Catholic people that did it, but it was the popes that in some cases instigated it and started it. In other cases, they didn't start it, but they allowed it. Mm -hmm. Just to give an example, uh, Pope Paul the the Fourth, he had a papal bull, which is a papal bull is like the most official Catholic statement uh, after the ex cathedra statements, and there have only been two to seven or eight or however many ex cathedra statements. But part of what he says is that in all future times in this city, meaning Rome, as in all other cities, holdings and territories belonging to the Roman Church, all Jews are to live solely in one and the same location. Or if that is not possible, in two or three or as many as are necessary, which are to be contiguous and separated completely from the dwellings of Christians. And they are to have only one entry and so to one exit. So if you think about ghettos, you know, where you concentrate Jewish people, they were, the Jews weren't in ghettos and separated by choice. They were had to be by the law of the Pope. Okay. Uh, two, 
They may only have one synagogue in its customary location, and they may construct no new synagogue, nor may they possess any real property. Accordingly, they must demolish and destroy all their other synagogues except for this one alone. The real property which they now possess, they must sell to Christians within a period of time. Okay, so they can't own land. Okay, that's kind of like the English not allowing Ireland to own land, you know, many mm -hmm. centuries later. All right, and then three, so they may be identified everywhere as Jews. Men and women are respectfully required and bound to wear in full view a hat or some obviously marking, both to be blue in color in such ways they not, may not be concealed or hidden. I think in Nazi Germany they had yellow stars, but here it's blue, so that makes them different. I guess. Yeah. I mean, um, that's it makes them stand out so they're identified. Yeah. Just like the Nazis did during World War II to identify the Jews. Right, right. Nor may they themselves or anyone they employ labor in public on Sundays or other feast days as declared by the church. Now, wait a second. Jews don't, uh, aren't supposed to do any work on Saturdays. So why Sunday? Because the Catholic Church said that Christians you know, wouldn't work on Sunday, so the Jews have to follow the Christian religion on this, or the Catholic religion on this point. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of stinks, if you're a Jew. <laughs> All right, seven. Nor they, may they, meaning the Jews, be so presumptuous as to entertain or dine with Christians or to develop close relations and friendships with them. Okay, now that's funny because um, Paul rebuked Peter in Galatians, for not eating with um, Gentile Christians when Jews were around. This is the opposite thing about where the Pope says that Christians and, and Jews are forbidden to ever eat together, mm -hmm. even if you're friends. Nine, additionally, these Jews may carry on no business as purveyors of grain, barley, or other items necessary for human substances, but must be limited in this sphere to dealing only in secondhand clothing. This is from Manfred R. Lehman's website www.manfredlayman.com slash news slash news underscore detail dot cgi slash 23 dash zero. So all of these things, and you can get this from other sources too, it's like, okay, this sounds pretty bad of what the Pope commanded against the Jews. Okay? Now the other thing is, um, let's see what the Pope said about themselves. In Dictatus Papi, probably written in 1075 AD, Pope Gregory the Seventh said, the Roman Church was founded by God alone. The Roman Pope alone can with right be called universal. He alone may use the imperial insignia. His feet only shall be kissed by all princes. He alone may depose the emperors. He himself may be judged by no one. The Roman Church has never erred, nor will it err in all eternity. This is from Austin's Topical History of Christianity, page 165. Okay, with that overconfident attitude, here's what the Romans did with the Inquisition. And again, we will have an entire sheet on the Inquisition. Uh, look in BibleQuery.org um, slash other beliefs slash Roman Catholicism uh, uh, slash Inquisition.html or dot. All right, the Inquisition started under Gregory the Ninth sometime between 1227 and 1233. And he included this in his register in the Constitution of Frederick II, which permitted the burning at the, at the stake of heretics. This is from the Inquisition, Hammer of Heresy, page 33. Now you say, well, what, what would Catholics, what would you think about that as a Catholic now or back then about the Pope saying you can burn at the stake heretics? Well, this is what was said in 1871 by the Catholic world. We have no right to ask questions of the Church any more than of Almighty God as a preliminary to our submission. Where to take with unquestioning docility whatever instruction the church gives. This is quoted by uh, Bart Brewer, a uh, debate of, of opponent um, in uh, actually debating Catholicism. And to this, I just got to say, baloney. As a Catholic, you have every right to question when a pope or somebody else tells you to burn somebody at the stake. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get on this in our next part, but this is probably why the Roman Catholicism had so much trouble with stuff, because you weren't allowed to question. Okay. Um, in, uh, in February 1231, Gregory IX issued the Constitution excommunicamus against both heretics and even those who merely do not denounce the heretics they might know to the authorities. It included life imprisonment for unrepentant heretics, the right to appeal was denied, and their homes were destroyed. That doesn't sound very Christ-like. On October 11, 1231, Gregory IX the Institute of Second Papal Bull, Ille Humani Generis. This is from the Inquisition, Hammer of Heresy, page 35 to 36. When you arrive in a town, you will summon the prelates, clergy, and people. 
and you will preach a solemn sermon. Then you will assume several discreet persons as assistants and begin your inquiry into beliefs of heretics and suspects with diligent care. They will already have been denounced. Those who, after examination, are recognized as guilty or suspected of heresy must promise to obey the orders of the church absolutely. If they do not, you should proceed against them, following the statutes that we have recently promulgated against the heretics. So this is having secret people go in and, uh, um, and find out and, and investigate suspects. Another ugly thing on a different topic is the Crusades and bloody persecution. Many are familiar with the Crusades to the Middle East, which was sort of a violent counterattack to a violent attack. It's almost like the Christian jihads. The Bible doesn't preach, you know, in the New Testament, Jesus never said to attack anybody, but jihads are almost like an ugly thing that the Catholic Church learned from Muslims. But anyway, but there were other crusades too. There were the crusades against the Cathars, who were non-Christian heretics, ex-Catholic I might add, but they were definitely heretics, But so that's why you kill them all. Crusade against the Waldenses, who are actually pretty good guys, who uh, just want to follow the Bible, you know, in like the 11, you know, hundreds and stuff, and, and up to the 1400s. There were crusades in Northern Europe called the Baltic Crusades against the Latvian, well today what's called the Latvians and Lithuanians. Uh, back then there were uh, Wends, W-E-N-D-S. There was persecution of Eastern Orthodox in Poland. There was persecution of Nestorians by the Portuguese Catholics in India. Then the papal states and papal armies. Uh, the papal states were lands mainly in central Italy owned by the papacy. They raised armies and fought for the Pope. Pope Innocent III made possible the future papal states. He also condemned the English Magna Carta uh, in England that would take power from the kings and give them to the barons. Pius IX persecuted the Jews, and he talked against separation of church and state. This is 1846 to 1848. He said Catholicism should be the state religion in lands with a majority of Catholics. He was against Bible societies and for the papal states. Okay. Another thing is look at Catholicism in the Americas. All right, Columbus, beside discovering America, he enslaved Indians and allows men to rape and kill them. For that, he was brought back in chains. However, I should say that the Pope had nothing to do with that, though. So not everything you can blame on the Pope. However, after that, the Spanish amputated the hands and feet of Indians that stole or did not submit to them. They enslaved Indians and raped many. The Pope did not order this treatment. However, the Pope did nothing to condemn it. Okay, this is done by his buddies, the Spanish and to some extent the Portuguese. Okay, you can find many horrible drawings of the Spanish of this, but let's just kind of uh, skip the ugly pictures though, okay, if you don't mind. So, on one hand, we can point out that the Pope did not stand against error during the monophylite controversy. However, multiple Popes being silent on this and the Nazi Holocaust are far more serious than being silent on um, monophilatism. Okay? There are at least 46 bad Popes. We have a two-hour uh, video series on that. But let me just recap, just because Keating says there are only six or seven. So, let me just give you more than six or seven. Sergius III... Morosia was his mistress, and he allegedly fathered Pope John XI, and popes claimed succession from him. Benedict IX uh, was very sexually immoral, and he sold the papacy and abdicated. Uh, popes claimed succession from him. Gregory IX had a crusade against the Holy Roman Empire in uh, Central Europe from Germany to Italy. He started the Inquisition in Languedoc in southern France. He endorsed the Crusades in northeastern Europe and the Baltics. And the Pope say that papal succession is from him. Uh, Gregory IX also ordered raiding the synagogues to confiscate all the Jewish Talmuds. Urban VI claimed he did not, not hear enough screaming when uh, people who were against him were captured and were tortured to death. And Popes claimed succession from him. Nicholas V had the bull Dumb the Verses and the 1455 bull Rom Romanus Pontifex authorizing capturing slaves. So authorizing the slave trade and capturing them, but only of non-Christians, he said. Uh, not a very good witness to non-Christians to say, well, we can enslave you because you're not a Christian. Sixtus IV from 1471 to 1484 uh, was one of many popes involved with nepotism. He made three nephews, a grandnephew, and one other relative cardinals. And the papal bull Exeget Sinceri Devotus Affectus to spread the Spanish Inquisition, almost like a cancer, 
uh, to Castile, which is a part of modern Spain. Yeah, the Venetians attacked the city of Ferrara for, uh, so a nephew of his could rule it. He sold offices and privileges for money. He promoted the Immaculate Conception of Mary. He confirmed Nicholas V's bulls for the Portuguese to enslave non-Christians. Julius II is called the Warring Pope, and he looted Italian cities. In uh, 1511, a church council suspended Julius II as Pope, but Julius and his armies just ignored it. So see our video uh, on, on the bad popes, or you can read our, our website at biblequery.org slash otherbeliefs slash Roman Catholicism slash list of bad popes dot html and dot. Okay, so the seventh thing, and there are probably more than seven, but we'll just um, stop at seven, was what about popes on trial? You had a Sabellian heretics of popes who were like into um, Sabellianism or, or, or modalism of Zephyrinus and Callistus I. You had Stephen the Sixth, eight ninety six, eight ninety seven A.D. We talked about, and the Cadaver Synod, where he had the corpse of Pope Formosus dug up. He tried him for heresy and convicted him, and cut off his fingers. And later on, uh, Pope Stephen the Sixth was murdered. Celestine the Fifth, he was not such a bad pope, but all his official acts he done were unofficialized by the ruthless Pope Boniface the Eighth. And after he resigned. And Boniface VIII took over. Celestine was murdered. All right. Also, Boniface ordered a crusade against the Kalana family. Boniface VIII was he involved in many wars, and he uh, wrote the Unum Sanctum, which is probably the the worst uh, one as far as overreaching the Pope's power. And he died after he was imprisoned. Pope Benedict XI reversed. Pope Boniface VIII, Papal Bull, Unum Sanctum, so he made it unofficialized. So, like, you can't really go by Papal Bulls because you never know how long they're going to last before they get unofficialized. And finally, Clement V tried Boniface VIII for heresy and for sodomy, you know, with uh, boys. Oh, by the way, I just want to mention to the viewers, there's a book that has been around for a long time. It's just called The Bad Popes, the E.R. Chamberlain. And uh, it documents a lot of this stuff. There's lots of material out there, especially with the Internet these days, right. that you can get all this information about bad popes. Yeah, and, and you can see a lot in, like, a Wikipedia and other sources. And, you know, just to kind of say, it's like there's a lot of it. To be candid here, um, has any past, uh, Protestant or uh, pastors ever done anything wrong um, or had any scandals? Yes, unfortunately that's happened. What happens to them? Well, they are immediately fired uh, and, and, and dismissed, or in, in some cases, even arrested. Mm -hmm. What happened to these popes after they did this? For most part, they continued on in power. Now, a number of them got murdered later, uh, but I guess that's how you do papal succession uh, murder. <laughs> that's one of the methods. One yeah. of the methods. Uh, also, sex, like that one pope fathering another pope right. through a mistress. Yeah. So, I mean, that's see, another way. See, so, you don't have to have a wife if you're a pope because you can just ha ha have a mistress. So with, 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 so, so, with all these things, it, it's like, um, you know, the, the, the issue is not that there are bad people and the bad people can get in power, but the real issue is um, they stay in power because they're considered, you know, too important to not, you know, as, as pope. In a way, it kind of reminds me of that Roman Catholic rule about priests. You have know, priests and they're ordained by the Roman Catholic Church to be priests, but then let's say they uh, decide not to be priests, or they leave the Roman Catholic Church, or things like that, but their rules say that guy is still a priest. Mm -hmm. He's still a priest, even though he quit being a priest. He's not a Roman Catholic. He's off being a drunk at a bar, but he's still a priest. Mm -hmm. So I assume the Pope is just like an exalted priest of all time, right? <laughs> but... You know, he's still considered a priest. Yeah, what, or, what, 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 a pope all the Well, time. Julius was so bad that a church council actually deposed him. But Juli Julius II, rather. And Julius II just ignored it. And he, yeah. was, he kept yeah, yeah, him yeah. as pope anyway. Yeah. Uh, all right. Some of the popes, like Callistus, were heretics. And I'll just read from you from what Hippolytus says. Callistus corroborated the heresy of these Noetians, but we have already carefully explained the details of his life. And Callistus himself produced likewise a heresy and derived his starting point from these Noetians. Namely, so far as he acknowledges there is one Father in God, viz. the creator of the universe, and that this God is spoken of and called by the name of Son, yet that in substance he is one spirit. Okay, sounds like Sabellianism. 
-hmm. For the spirit as a deity is, he says, not any being different from the Logos, or the Logos from the deity. Therefore, this one person, according to Callistus, is divided nominally, but not substantially so, i.e. divided in name, but not in substance. He supposes this one Logos to be God, and affirms that there is in case of the word an incarnation. This is from Hippolytus' Refutation of All Heresies, Book 10, uh, Chapter 23, in the Anti-Nicene Fathers, uh, Volume 5, uh, page 148, right here. So, um, so this, this pope was a heretic, except for one thing. Um, in Hippolytus' time, they weren't called popes. They were called bishops. <laughs> there weren't any popes in Rome. So right. this bishop was a heretic. Right. All right. So, um, so going back, kind of roadmap where we are. We're talking about why Catholics don't need a pope. Uh, we've kind of gone through that unfortunately horrible results of papal succession. We can go a lot more into that, but let's stop that for now. Uh, I think you've got a taste and you can do more research well, on like your own. We've got a two-hour video that went through into a lot more detail than you did here. You were just kind of right. breezing through it real fast. And then uh, next we're going to go through that there's no excuse for a Christian leader to do these things. I promise this will be much shorter. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll talk about how papal succession didn't do anything, at least good at least. Other churches did better without a Roman Pope, possible Pope replacements, and exactly where do we go from here? All right, so uh, first of all, some Catholics are unaware or unwilling to admit that these happened. Initially, you know, you think that, well, they're kind of unwilling to admit this, but from some ex-Catholics I've talked to, and, and uh, it's like, no, it's not that they're unwilling, it's just they're totally unaware. In all of their Catholic schooling, they never heard this once. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why don't you hear, you know, the full story, not just the good side? Uh, I don't know. Well, I know. It's because if they tell you the full story, maybe a lot of them are going to leave. So they don't want to have people leave their religion, and they'll lose money and income when people leave their religion. So they got to keep it as clean and pristine as they can mm -hmm. so people don't find out the truth. And this is typical of most of your religious cults. Mm -hmm. uh, one Achilles heel of cults, and I've mentioned this many times because that was really where I started doing my apologetics was the Jehovah's Witnesses. Their mm. history just destroys their whole religion. Yep. And so they are working hard to hide that history mm -hmm. from their own people uh, so that they don't find out the truth and then leave. Okay. And so I've dealt, I've dealt with their history again and again over the decades, and by God's grace, we've been able to get a lot of them out of the Jehovah's Witness. The same with Mormonism mm -hmm. or any of these other cults. You do Mount that. Meadows Massacre, yeah. Yeah, and see, but so the cults try to hide that stuff from their mm -hmm. people so they can keep them in there. So right. that's the simple reason right there, why they, yeah. they, 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 they gloss over the bad stuff and just try to present the good stuff like we're God's organization. Yeah, and, and I would say as an evangelical, you know, you shouldn't, you know, you should... Be a, it wouldn't be afraid to read any history, the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, you know, good and bad. It's like, but at least know about it. Uh, you know what's funny, though, the irony of this whole thing is uh, in our day and age, they've now published almost everything on Islam, the authoritative Hadith, uh, the Seer of Muhammad, uh, the Quran, right. all that stuff in English. Right. But in, in, you know, a century ago, you didn't have that. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, on the Internet, you can read all this stuff that's actual Islamic teaching in English. And one thing about those hadiths is they just tell you what happened. You know, mm -hmm. like Muhammad's sleeping with his, his sex slave in, right. in his own one of his wife's bed. She catches it. And he gets in all this. You're just given the story of all this terrible stuff, chopping mm -hmm. off people's heads. And, and so at least in Islam, they, they don't try to hide it so much because it's just right there in all their authoritative works. Right. But now a lot of their political leaders don't want the vast majority of people to see all this because mm -hmm. they never had to worry about it before because it wasn't right there in, in right. our language. But anyway, right. go ahead. So going back to Roman Catholicism, you know, maybe some who know the history are, are too ashamed to discuss it. All right, but um, Carl Keating, at least he lightly mentions it, so that's good for him. However, he also said, he mentions it in Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 315 and 16, and his comment is, all Catholics should regret that these happened. Okay, so there's kind of a breath of honesty there. Yeah, the key is, though, lightly mentioned it. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it, 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 yeah. when he only said there were six or seven bad popes, we take issue with that. But 
you know, he does better than some that, that deny everything. So Keating, in, in the Francis feud, says the popes are very bad. Some popes are very bad. And um, he says something, in a way it surprised me, but maybe it shouldn't have, I don't know. He says that sometimes the Holy Spirit let the cardinals make the wrong choice for Pope. Rather than paraphrase, let me give you his exact words. This is in the Francis Feud, uh, page 82 and 83. This is in uh, Lawler's book, and so Francis Keating is actually talking about that. He says, I've always found curious that many Catholics, the majority of practicing ones, I would say, think that the Holy Spirit positively determines the outcomes of conclaves. Conclaves are where the cardinals get together to choose a pope. As though his invocation amounted to an urim and thummim, you know, which were the, what the Old Testament priests had. Such a view stumbles when confronted with names such as John the Twelfth and Alexander the Sixth, two of the most unsavory occupants of the Holy See. Well, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, <laughs> could the Holy Spirit have insisted that such men be put at the head of the church? And if so, to what positive end? Well, at least he's saying a little bit about it. Nowhere near the gruesome details of a lot of what we've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, but give him some credit. He, he, <laughs> he is saying a little bit about it. All right, so no Cardinal Ratzinger was right. The only assurance he offers is that the thing cannot be totally ruined. That's a modest consolation. Very bad things can happen, but not a complete failure of the church. In other words, at times the wrong man must have been elected pope. Lawler thinks this is what happened in 2013. Mm. Okay. The Holy Spirit was at work in the conclave, but perhaps too few electors interpreted his promptings properly. Many people may disagree with Lawler in many things, but his understanding of the role of the Holy Spirit is correct. Many defenders of Francis misconstrue church teaching on this point. All right, so that's a, probably, I'm guessing, a novel concept to many Catholics. Coming but, from Carl Keating. In his, yeah, yeah, his yeah book, of, of Catholic Francis. answers. So given the bad popes, 46 plus, we can see, yes, it is kind of obvious that sometimes um, the Holy Spirit led, uh, let a wicked man become the pope. And, 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 and Keating says sometimes the wrong guy uh, succeeded as Pope. Well, I think part of the problem is in a lot of this papal succession, as, as we've already discussed in this video so far and in the other two-hour video we did, uh, that one of the keys to succession of the Popes is nepotism. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there just wasn't enough nepotism done by the guy that should have been the Pope instead of Francis. <laughs> he he should have got more yeah. of his relatives in there to vote for him. <laughs> Maybe so, I don't know. And then um, what Keating uh, tries to salvage here is he says the popes may have said some bad things and done some bad things, but the things that they said were not official acts, and they didn't deny teaching on doctrine and morals. And so Keating is saying that the pope is infallible on doctrines and morals only. What's funny about that is just based on everything we've been discussing here and in that other two-hour video, they were failing on morals and doctrine. Yeah, yeah, what, 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 well, he didn't say they were infallible on doing morals, just infallible <laughs> on teaching morals. Um, so, so, well, so, those, so, those, those papal bulls sure seem to be morally fail, failing on all well, fronts. Well, on the persecuting Jews, on the Inquisition, yeah. uh, to me those are uh, teaching moral failing. Uh, I don't know if Keating would see that or not. Now, uh, there, there's a new argument, well, new to me, that I was totally unaware of until I read it in Keating's book. And let, let me try to briefly summarize it and do it, do it it justice. He is saying that papal infallibility, according to Keating, is not positive, only negative. So it doesn't mean that the right stuff gets taught. It just means that the wrong stuff doesn't get taught. And so he had a little test here, and we'll see how y'all do in the test. I'll just tell you that I failed it. Uh, and, 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 and Keating's test is this. He said, uh, Pope's teaching is only on doctrine and morals. Pretend for a second that infallibility extended to math. And let's say that the Pope was infallible on in math, and you gave him a 100-question test on trigonometry. Mm. If the Pope was infallible on in math, how many questions would he get right? assuming he was infallible in math. Mm -hmm. What would you think, Larry? If infallibility well, were correct with math. Well, if it were, he would, he would logically, 
if you put it all together, he was supposed he was supposed to get all 100. percent Okay, so according to Keating, um, you just failed to understand the fallibility. <laughs> so and, and the, according to Keating, it's like well, if the Pope hadn't studied trigonometry, he wouldn't know any of the answers. So he might get zero right, but infallibility would kick in because he wouldn't answer them. So he'd have a blank. So he wouldn't get any wrong, but he would have a zero if he hadn't studied trigonometry. So, 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 so Keating goes on to say, "Go." He fails on. logic. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so he's he's redefining it. He's not failing logic. He's redefining, well, to me at least, defining infallibility. And so it's an interesting way. Um, so, so, so he said, infallibility doesn't mean the Pope's going to teach the right stuff. It just says that he will not say anything or be blank as far as the wrong stuff. And, and of course, on occasion, he might say the wrong stuff is wrong, too. You he know. fails the logic, in my opinion, because he's equivocating. And that's exactly what it sounds like to me. One thing that uh, Gary uh, Wills uh, uh, points out, and we'll get to it a little later, is that he says that he, that papal infallibility gets defined so narrowly that it's almost meaningless. Well, so, so, it is so, this, so, so this is an, another Catholic <laughs> criticizing this. This view. he didn't criticize Keating by name, but, but, but this view. So let's look at papal succession not doing anything good. At least the Pope did nothing to stop the following. The papal succession does not guarantee stuff, and papal succession only guarantees. All right. So first, the Pope did nothing to stop or criticize all of the ugly things that we talked about earlier. In fact, some of them he instigated. In 1156, the English-born Pope Adrian IV had a papal bull that many Irish people know about. It's called Laudabilitur, given the English blessing to conquer Catholic Ireland. All right, so Ireland was already Catholic. It actually sent a lot of Catholic monks to other countries. And the English king was given the right and authority, quote, from God via the English Pope to conquer Ireland. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Irish people were supposed to welcome the English monarch as their new king. All right. Um, why did they do that? To convert the, the Irish to, to Catholicism? No, the Irish were already Catholics. Mm -hmm. He just, I don't know, maybe the, the Pope being English has something to do with it. Yes, yes. It's just a political decision. It had nothing uh, to do uh, with uh, that. All right. So anyway, the, the, so you think that the popes have never made official mistakes and you're Irish? Hmm. Okay. Uh, the other thing that is kind of confusing, you have to watch the footwork here, is that burning to death heretics, like Joan of Arc, she was burned to death in 1431. Uh, again, the Pope was English. She had this, I guess, I, and, and they actually questioned her theologically, you know, at her, quote, trial. And um, she answered pretty well, like at least for the theology of the time, that, that she, she actually knew her stuff. Uh, but she had the, I guess, heretical idea that, you know, France kind of ought to be for a Frenchman, you know, not for the English. And she was burned at the stake, which seemed pretty um, official, I would think. She appealed to the Pope. The Pope did nothing to stop it at all. So what good's the Pope? Anyway, later on, though, the Pope and others declared, who was not English in 1456, declared her innocent. So the Pope did declare her innocent after she had been burned. And the Pope changed nationalities. Right, right. And, and then she was finally canonized as a saint in 1920. So if you're declared as a heretic and burn at the stake for a heretic, I guess the Catholic Church is saying that you're a heretic, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. So did was Joan of Arc in hell from 1431 and 1456, and then she became a Catholic saint later? Is she a saint who went to hell and then went to heaven? Yes. Or did the um, Catholic Church trials and stuff mess up badly? They messed up badly just proving one more time it's just a whole false setup. The whole thing is false. And this okay. is just one example of many that okay. we've been going through. Kind of okay. burns down, yeah. <laughs> the other thing, which is really, really ugly, and there are pictures of this, but we're not going to show the pictures. We can, you know, you trust you can look for yourself. The king of France, who was fairly friendly toward Protestants, all of a sudden there was this big wedding of the future king of France and his bride, a Catholic and a Protestant, on August 23rd, 24th, in 1572, the French Protestants were all massacred. Uh, all the nobles, that is. 5,000 to 30,000. We're not sure of the numbers. 
Now, the fact that a Spanish army was approaching France to uh, ensure that the Protestants were done away with may have had something to do with it. Yes. But it wasn't the Spanish that did this, it was the French that did this. Mm -hmm. All right, so Catholic, France was fairly friendly toward Protestants until this time. Um, and it's like, what did the Pope say about this? Well, initially, the Pope uh, had uh, hymns sung uh, in honor of this. Mm -hmm. Now, the Pope was told that, oh, they were all rebelling from France, and so that's why we, we, we um, you know, sang praises that these rebels were killed. Later on, the Pope was found out that he'd been misinformed, and they were coming, they were gathering for a wedding, not for fighting, and so, but then the Pope didn't say, oh, I'm sorry, and he didn't say that the people who did this ought to receive justice, no. So the Pope didn't, as far as things to where the Pope really could have done something, or, or at least not done something bad, the Pope fell down, didn't do anything. Well, all of a sudden, though, 5,000 to 30,000 Protestants <coughs> are suddenly conveniently eliminated from the situation. Right. Uh, and, 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 of course, you know, um, a couple of centuries later, you had the French Revolution, and it's like, so it kind of happened again um, to, you know, Catholics also, but, like, there was this president. So, uh, getting back to what papal succession means in uh, point P2, it never means that the wrong person wouldn't become Pope, as we mentioned in uh, the Francis feud, 82-83, according to Carl Keating. And you can just read about these popes. Alexander VI, Boniface VIII, Julius II, who attacked cities in Italy, or Benedict IX. All right, news for you. These are the wrong guys that you want to have as a leader of your church. And they became leader anyway. So what good does papal succession do? Okay, The popes, they provide a lot of bad examples. Violence, wicked, immoral, they're nepotistic men. They should not have been leaders as pope. The popes failed in supporting correct teaching, like in monothelitism. And we, as we talked about before, uh, Keating gives the idea that infallibility only works negatively. And I don't think Keating alone believes this. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that every Catholic has necessarily figured this out. Well, it's, like I said before, <coughs> Roman Catholicism as a whole is just filled with people with all different types of beliefs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it's, just a, it's just a mess. It's like you just throw in all kinds of theologies and beliefs. Uh, Lumen Gentium of Vatican II even says atheists can be saved. They just right. got to have enough sincerity. Now, you know? now, prior popes would have totally disagreed with that. Of course. But, but then again, you know, we talked about it in another video about Pope Clement XI and things that he anathematized, they were all pretty good biblical things. Yes, we covered um, that. We and covered that whole list. And it's in Gary Will's book, too, the one you, I think is on the bottom here. Right. He, he lists that on page 182, 183 for anyone. We're not going to repeat what we yeah. did in another but, video. But, but, but we would Instead. recommend you might want to get his book of Why I'm a Catholic. Um, and it's written by a Catholic. Yeah. And he's now, telling now, a lot. Now, 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 since we mentioned his book a couple of times, I, I, I should probably do him justice and at least say what the main point of his book was, or at least one of the main points. Mm -hmm. And he honest, very honestly mentions a lot of the evil things that various popes have done and the horrible things that have happened. And what he says is, why, why, he gets asked, why are you still a Catholic, or, or something like that. Why aren't you at least honest enough to leave the church, or something like that. And his answer is, he's still a Catholic, because he says the church is bigger than the popes. Oh, uh, so he's making an idol out of the church itself. Yeah. yeah so it yeah. doesn't matter how bad the church is. Or, or, how, or, or how bad the Pope is. Or yeah. how bad the teachings or the history, <coughs> tradition. It doesn't matter because the church right. is the idol. Yeah, 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 now, now, here's the thing. Paradoxically, um, I would halfway agree with him. The church is bigger than the Pope's. But I would, in disagreeing with him, I'd say the church is bigger than the Catholic church. The church is all believers uh, who, who, who put their trust in Christ. The terms. Totally the different true than he does. biblical terminology relating to what the word church means. Right. Based on what the word of God says versus what he's defining as the church, yes, which yes. is Roman Catholicism, so, so, so that, which is that, totally that, different. That's where I'm disagreeing with him. So, yes. yes, the church of Jesus Christ is far bigger than the Pope. In fact, in many cases, Catholics would agree that some of the popes are going to hell. And so they're not even a part of, of uh, you know the, of the 
true Church of Jesus Christ as God sees it. So the Church of Jesus Christ is bigger than the Pope. The Church of Jesus Christ is bigger uh, than the Roman Catholic Church. So I wish he would get to that last point, but he didn't quite get there. He didn't quite make it. So it's, yeah. His idol remains in place. Right. Uh, he should be worshiping Jesus Christ of the Bible, the Word of God, not some man-made structure that's right. proven itself so false over so many centuries. Anyway. Right. According to Keating, getting back to Keating, papal succession only guarantees the Pope won't deny key doctrines, not even practices, of the Church. This is in Debating Catholics, page 82, and, and Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 225. So, reading through most of Keating's books, I got the idea that papal succession is non-falsifiable. Absolutely nothing could happen, according to Keating, uh, this is my false impression, um, <laughs> that, 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 that would break infallibility. All right, well, towards the end of one of his books, uh, Keating corrected my misperception. Misper he said that, well, what could theoretically break papal infallibility is if you had a pope that denied, like the virgin birth, or Jesus was God, or Jesus you know, died for our sins, or rose from the dead, or ascended to heaven. So if a pope denied that, then papal infallibility would fall. Okay, so it's not totally unfalsifiable like I was thinking as I before I finished reading Keating's stuff. That's mm -hmm. I guess why it's important to read the entire book, not just pieces. Right. Right. Um, but it sure is a very small set. Other people believe those things too, and they actually didn't need a pope <laughs> uh, to believe that. <laughs> uh, all right, but Keating does point out that a pope like Pope Liberius, he could be persuaded to put out not a doctrinally wrong statement, but a doctrinally ambiguous statement in 352 A.D., According to Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 226, 227, and Debating Catholicism, page 82. Yeah. He also gave another example of Vigilius and Honorius with um, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 229. And then uh, we talked about the trigonometry example that it only works uh, negatively, according to him. And he says it's only an official pronouncement. And I don't think that Keating wrote like, he didn't write like he was aware that some official announcements in papal bulls got, have gotten unofficialized. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. like uh, Pope Celestine V, which he talked about, which was, um, but that's all that papal succession is, according to Keating. Just the Pope won't totally ruin it, according to Ratzinger. He won't say anything that denies a key doctrine in an official statement that's not unofficialized. I added that part. Uh, but that's all it is. Well, they're ignoring the fact that what they've taught for centuries, a large majority of their teachings has is just biblically false. It's just not what the Bible teaches. Well, the, 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 yes, but I think a lot of Catholics don't care so much because they say we go, you know, they claim the church gave the Bible, and so right, what right. the Pope says is kind of more important. So, but then we're showing here that no, you don't want to go by what some of those popes said. Yeah. So it's like, what do you got now? Yeah. I will say this about uh, what Keating says. All Catholics don't disagree with him. Let me read to you what uh, Gary Will says on Why I'm a Catholic, page 285 to 287. He has a point of rebuttal. He says, Those who deny that the papacy has changed rely on two main dodges. First, they say that all preceding changes were developments. All right, but they were development toward a single final concept of the papacy, a concept implicit from the outset. And he goes on to say about how some Catholics say, well, they might have been bad things, but they were going toward a good thing. And he talks more about that, which I'm going to skip because I want to focus on the second point. I said there were two dodges used by Papists to deny the, the changing nature of the papacy. The second one is to define infallibility down, so narrowing it that every changeable papal statement is excluded from its purview. That's exactly what Keating is doing. Exactly. But that just demonstrates that the historical reality of papal teaching has little to do with infallibility. We're told by Baptists that the Pope was infallible through all history. We just did not notice that fact because he did not exercise his gift, even where we might most expect it. What more appropriate time for using it than in condemning the heresy of Pelagius? But Zosimus failed to do that. He must have been saving up his infallibility for some other occasion. <laughs> In, in Catholics do have a sense of humor. Uh, in the same way, Honorius did not use his gift of inerrancy to condemn monothelitism. In fact, he advocated it and was called a heretic by a council and later popes. Boniface was not saved by his infallibility from saying that outside the church there is no salvation. 
Popes, it turns out, can err over and over again on matters affecting eternal salvation, consigning people to hell for mortal sins like taking interest on loans, using contraceptives, remarrying, eating meat on Friday, without calling into question their inerrant power. They can release souls in purgatory or assure the entrance of saints into heaven, all without abusing, because never using, the gift of infallibility. Then what was the gift for? Apparently for two reasons only. The definition of Mary's Immaculate Conception in 1854 and of her bodily assumption to heaven in 1950. This is a very odd gift of the Spirit, one not vital to the life of the Church for most of its two, first two millennia of its existence. So if, it, if papal infallibility only uh, applies to these two extra thedra statements, Catholic writer Gary Mills says that cap, papal infallibility isn't doing anything. That's right. And that's coming from a Roman Catholic, not uh, some Protestant or right. evangelical. Yeah. So going back to our roadmap here of why Catholics don't need a pope, after the introduction, we discussed some of the horrible results of papal succession. We said there's no excuse for Christian leaders to do these things. Uh, papal succession didn't do anything good, or anything good at least. Now we're going to discuss other churches did better without a Roman pope. We're going to talk about possible pope replacements and exactly where to go from here. So looking at other churches, now these other churches, they didn't have the, quote, benefit of Roman popes. What did they do? Moreover, if a pope influenced these things, then we're going to see a conclusion that the Catholics are better without popes. So let's look at other churches that didn't have Roman popes. There are at least seven Eastern Orthodox churches, the Russian, Albanian, Greek, Serbian, Antioch, and there's even a small Japanese or, or the Orthodox church. They have leaders called patriarchs, but they really aren't analogous to popes because they don't have so much power. You know, just like you might have the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, he doesn't have as much power as a patriarch. Well, the patriarch doesn't have as much power as a pope. All right, and then another church is the Coptic Church, also called the Monophysites. They were called heretics in 451 AD, but uh, they're now in communion with Rome, but not the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, they have a pope, but their pope doesn't claim the same power that the Roman popes do. You had another church, uh, the Nestorian Church. They were actually pretty prominent at certain periods in history in China and parts of India and in Central Asia. They were declared heretics in 431 AD. One reason is because they, Nestorius and Nestorians refused to call Mary the Theotokos, the bearer of God. And as a Protestant, I don't see any problem with that. But the Nestorians did have a, some, oh, a couple of things I do see a problem with. Um, one is they said that Christ had two wills, a human will and divine will. And um, they kind of messed up on, on the um, person of Christ. And I think that's a, a serious problem. A second serious problem is that they really uh, uh, were... Pelagian in their outlook. They really like Theodore of Mopsuestia, um, who was who was a Pelagian. So I'm not saying the historians were all right, but I'll just mention that they were prominent, they were a church, and they didn't have a pope. So we're going to look at them uh, through our lens a little bit later. You have other churches of uh, the Anglicans, Lutherans, and Reformed churches. And then you had Swiss Anabaptists, and you had Mennonites. And so these are all churches that have been around a while, and they don't have popes. All right, so let's kind of look at them. Take a break from looking at Roman Catholic for just a second. All right, so what about these other churches? Did these other churches have persecution of Jews? Some, in Eastern Europe, there was a little bit, not that much, but, but some. Other than that, none. No persecution of Jews. Did any of these other churches have inquisitions? No, only the Roman Catholic Church needed to have inquisitions for whatever reason. Well, of course, we know the reason the, the popes instituted it. These other churches didn't have crusades. Now, the, the uh, emperor in Constantinople, they requested crusades to help them, so they kind of did a little bit. But other than that, it was only the Catholics that had the crusades. Okay. Uh, did the other churches that burned to death heretics? All right. Uh, for the most part, no. Unfortunately, Lutherans and Calvinists, they did learn this from the Catholics, so that is bad. But the other churches, they didn't burn to death heretics. Only the Roman Catholics, you know, and to some extent others needed to. The leaders of these other churches, they didn't have popes that blessed them to go invade fellow Christian lands. They didn't have amputation, rape, enslavement, torture, and murder in the New World. 
frankly, uh, as far as evil in the world, I'm glad these churches did not have a, a violent, wicked Roman popes. So just looking at their track record of deeds, um, these guys didn't have a pope, and they did better. And there might be a reason for that, is if you have a pope to justify evil, then maybe someone's more likely to do it than if they have to kind of think for themselves on that. Okay. Let me ask you, did the popes have anything to do with at least 19 persecutions of Jews? Yes, they did. You didn't have that with the others. You had some with Eastern Orthodox and some with Lutherans also, actually. Inquisitions. The popes did have stuff to do with that. The popes had stuff to do with crusades in Northern Europe. They promised remission of sins if you would participate in the crusades in the Middle East or the Baltic crusades. In Italian towns or, or killing as part of a crusade, Waldenses or St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. The popes had something to do with all of those, except for St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, where they didn't instigate it, but they didn't condemn it either. The popes, and only the popes, burned to death heretics, quote-unquote heretics, like Joan of Arc. Other churches didn't have to do that. And then in 1156, repeating the English-born Pope Adrian IV had a papal bull so that the popes had blessing to conquer Ireland. Did a Nestorian patriarch or um, ever tell a Nestorian to go conquer something? No. Did a Coptic pope ever do that? No. Um, did a, a Eastern Orthodox pope? Um, I'm not aware of them uh, having these things to go conquer the state. So it's only the pope. So you see my point that it looks to me like um, the churches that didn't have popes, at least as far as the amount of evil, uh, were better off than the one church that did have a Roman pope. Going back to our roadmap with the introduction, after that we had unfortunately horrible results of papal succession. No excuse for Christian leaders to do these things. Papal succession didn't do anything, good at least. Other churches did better without a Roman pope. Now let's do some experimentation, so to speak, and let's investigate possible pope replacements and then afterwards we'll talk about where to go from here. So we talked before about uh, Keating's book The Francis Feud. Then we'll talk about more unsavory popes. Then we'll talk about the future of the Roman Catholic Church. I was kind of surprised at seeing some stuff in, in this part. And then we're going to ask is every Protestant their own pope or is, there, or is there a pastor their pope? And what if our pope was the Bible? How would that work? So we're going to get into all this here. So in, in Keating's book, The Francis Feud, Carl Keating has researched a lot of criticism of, of Pope Francis. I haven't, so I'm just going to kind of summarize some of his points and go off of what he said. Uh, what he's kind of painting in broad strokes, he talks there's a lot of disappointment and criticism of Pope Francis by Catholics. And he says some of it is uh, unjustified and uh, isn't really uh, valid or is even, maybe even slander. Okay. But there's other criticism that maybe it's correct or maybe it's not, but by the authors it was unsubstantiated. For example, it says people have claimed that Pope Francis is very arrogant, dismissive of people, and habitually uses vulgar language. And this was said by the author Colonna in, in the Francis Few, page 36. And then Keating goes on to say, but some criticism of, by Catholics of Pope Francis might be valid. Like he had dictatorial uh, control, like Perón, the former dictator of Argentina. He summarily dismisses those who are not his supporters. No uh, warning, no chance to transition, just kind of rudely just fire him on the spot. And they said that Pope Francis has an uh, insult-rich rhetoric. And reading what he has, Carl Keating says, well, Pope Francis is probably guilty of those. And then he says in his papal bull, he has ambiguous statements to test the waters on changing church teaching. But Keating kind of makes a point that whether you agree with Keating on other points or not, you kind of got to agree with him on this point. He says that given these uh, valid criticism of Francis, and even if you throw in the unsubstantiated ones, Pope Francis isn't nearly as bad as some of the previous popes. Well... He's got a valid point. Yeah, because we've already spent a lot of time going over all his previous popes, and they're a pretty sad lot. Pope Francis may be a disappointment. There may be lots of Catholic websites saying he's bad or illegitimate, but Pope Francis actually looks kind of good compared to some of those worst well, popes. Well, yeah, it just depends on who you want to compare <laughs> it to. Right. But Keating kind of says, well, Pope Francis isn't as bad as, as some of the others. 
and this point is in the Francis Feud, page 111 and 112. And then Keating goes to say, well, of all the bad popes, there are only six or seven, and we've covered this before, but there are at least 46 of them that I've seen. As bad as they are, and since we've covered this in other th things, we won't go into it again, let's move ahead to the future of the Roman Catholic Church. All right, in Babylon and Revelation, the great whore Babylon that all the kings of the earth drink the maddening wines of the authorities, who is this Babylon and Revelation? The classical reform view is that uh, this is Rome. And what Carl Keating says is, yeah, this is Rome. I was kind of surprised to hear Keating say this. And he goes into a lot of justification for that, which basically is valid in a Debating Catholicism, page 185, and Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 198 to 205. So he says that when Peter says, you know, he who is in Babylon sends greetings, Babylon was uninhabited at the time. Peter, since they're persecuting Christians, wouldn't want it to be known that he was in Rome, so he used a code word that was understood by Jews and, I mean, Christians and also some Jews, that Babylon was Rome. Keating goes on to say that the Babylon mentioned in Revelation 14.8, 16, 19, 17, 5, and 18, 2 to 21. He says, Keating says, these all refer to Rome in Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 200 to 201. And my reaction to that is, huh, <laughs> he's right. <laughs> uh, I'm surprised he would say that, but he's right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, now Keating doesn't say the time period uh, of when it's Rome. So you know, he doesn't actually commit to saying, well, he believes this is during the tribulation and he's pre-trib or post-trib or amillennial. Um, right. Keating says evangelicals have different opinions on that, which they do. But Keating never says what either his opinion is or Catholic opinion is. But he does go so far as to say this is Rome. It's like, well, uh, amen to that. Well, it's interesting about that, too. We put up a video on our YouTube channel not too long ago of two Christian preachers out at the Vatican standing you know, like in, on the cover, this, standing mm -hmm. right in front of this book, this, this building here, uh, and they had a Bible in their hand. Mm -hmm. In fact, both of them had a Bible in their hands. And uh, they started talking about Revelation 17 and stuff like that, but it wasn't very long they were out there with these Bibles when the Vatican police uh, came up and, well, actually, uh, I think uh, Dr. Todd Baker in this video uh, said that the Vatican police were out 80 yards from them. Mm -hmm. And they were already yelling, no Bible, hmm. no Bible, from 80 yards away. And they moved in on them mm -hmm. to get them to get out of there with their Bibles. And they didn't even know, because they are too far away to know what they were talking about hmm. to the video machine. But uh, when they got there, they had to leave. And hmm. then they just reset up out of the actual Vatican grounds Okay. Further away, and then continue the video. But hmm. it's interesting about that uh, in the in in the sense that Keating, almost from what you're telling me here, from what you were citing, mm -hmm. would be agreeing with these two guys that got kicked out of that area because they were talking about Revelation, right? <laughs> and and, all and that stuff. One. And then I'm, I'm sitting here listening to you give this information. So I'm like. Maybe Keating would have liked what they were saying yeah. out there when he got yeah, kicked now, out by now, the now, now, if you think about it, there was a lot of persecution by Nero, you know, 55, 60 AD. And Revelation, you know, was written by the Apostle John. And it was probably the last book of the Bible written. And it was probably written around 90 to 100 AD. So it's, it's, if it's a prophecy, it wouldn't really refer to Nero. It would refer to later. And who would the leader of Babylon be? I'll give you a hint. It's probably not the mayor of Rome. Uh, <laughs> So it's got to be the leader, and who would the leader be? Some Catholics have said that the Babylon and Revelation will be the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't say it currently is the Catholic Church, but will be. Mm -hmm. And so Keating didn't actually commit to that view, but it seems like he's pretty you know, close to towards it, if, if that's not his view. Yeah, that's why, and, I, that's why I thought of that video just now. I mean, wow, yeah. you know, he should have been out there with those two guys. <laughs> yeah. So the question is, if the Catholics are supposed to follow the Pope, they're not supposed to question it any more than God himself. Let's say that the, that the Antichrist became head of the, of, of the Roman organization. Well, you know, there's uh, already been a lot of them. 
There have so been a lot of one more. And, what's and, one and, more and, antichrist? And, and so would, would, would Catholics follow them? You know, if they were a tool of Satan? But they followed all the other antichrist popes. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> so if you're a Catholic today, um, I want you to ask yourself, how bad would a pope be before you um, wouldn't follow him? Would he have to be as bad as as the as Revelation says about Babylon, or or is that not bad enough? Uh, what if he did the other things, like told you to um, you know kill all the men, women, and children? Is that okay if the Pope says that, or is that too bad? You know, at what point would you say that it's too bad? And if I was Catholic living back then, I just would have to disobey the Pope if he commanded me to do that, mm-hmm. um, because you can't if you just blindly say, well. I'm off the hook and God will understand because I obeyed my Pope. No, he won't because God told us to obey Jesus and, he, and, we're, and we're to pay no attention to, to, to men who reject the truth. So God will judge you if you're not following Christ and the fact that you say, well, I follow the Pope isn't going to do you any good. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting too that you've had all these large numbers of popes that were just pure antichrist they're just uh immoral wretches mm. involved in every kind of debauchery you can think of and yet people were staying in that church and even if they didn't like what the popes were they would still think oh this church it's mm-hmm. the true church like Gary and Wells, so they yeah. turn a blind eye to all kinds of terrible stuff going on right because they made an idol out of this this building there in Rome and and the church itself, not the biblical church as a scripture and we've already described and defined, mm-hmm. but they made an idol out of this this outfit that claims to be the only one true church. Right. And so they just turned a blind eye to all the terrible stuff mm-hmm. and they would keep following re- re- the re- re- Rather than saying that this is wrong. Now, Keating... Uh, in a few places says that this is wrong, so that's good. And, and Gary uh, Wills has said it in more places. Now, so, so if these popes are bad, then who should we have as our pope? Well, let's explore a couple things. The Catholics have often claimed that with Protestants, every man's a pope. Every mm-hmm. man's their own pope. Yeah. This was actually not said by Carl Keating but in any of his five books, but many Catholics have said that. And this is false. It's not a good idea, and it's false too, because Protestants don't say they speak infallibly. They don't say they're inerrant. So every man is not his own pope. The Catholic Church has made a bunch of stuff up. Limbo, which they now reject. Partial indulgences, plenary indulgences, immaculate conception of Mary. Mary is our mediatrix. Mary is our redemptrix. And Mary is the queen of heaven. All right, so this is all just made up stuff that's bad that you shouldn't follow. And the popes have been a part of this, and this is bad. Unfortunately, I have to point the finger at ourselves and say... Uh, Protestants have made up stuff too. <laughs> There's a traducianism, which is actually came from Eastern Orthodox, uh, but traducianism said that you are sinful because your mother and father were sinful, and so you share the guilt of their sins. So with a uh, Serbian Orthodox, if your parents were, you know, collaborators, you know, with Nazis in World War II, then you should be killed because you have the guilt for that. Despite what the Old Testament says in, in several Ezekiel places, 18, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, that you cannot, the, the son cannot be held for the sins of his his father. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyway, so they're once again just ignoring what the Scripture says. But go ahead. Yeah. So Protestants have also made up. Other stuff, like uh, Lutherans and in Geneva burning heretics. Actually, they first learned that from the Catholics, but unfortunately, Protestants did that too. Easy believism, you know, you accept Christ and then you can go live with, you know, do what you want. Or Christ was running in 1975, you know, with, you know, that was said by someone in four words. So uh, Protestants have made up junk also. Well, don't forget that guy that said Christ will return in 1988. Mm-hmm. And then when it didn't happen, and that was book, by the way, was a bestseller. Okay. And when it didn't happen, he came out with another book the next year saying, well, Christ will return in 1989. Right. And that sold millions of copies. So, so I, I don't know why he didn't put out another one for <laughs> yeah. 1990. You know, but yeah. anyway. So Catholics, uh, popes have made a bunch of junk up. Unfortunately, Protestants have made junk up too. But there's a difference and that other Protestants can see that these are made up and see that these are not in the Bible. Catholics can't do that. They have to go with what the Pope says if the Pope said it. Mm-hmm. Now, here's another idea. Keating says that for many fundamentalists, their pastor is their Pope. This is kind of like saying that, well, they don't read the Bible for themselves, but they trust their pastor, and whatever their pastor says, I'm going to follow that. 
that would be sort of making a pastor like the Pope, and that is a bad idea. <laughs> My former pastor at, at a church, um, he said from the pulpit that you should check out everything he said against Scripture, and if he if what he says is against Scripture, he says don't believe him. Yeah, and that's what most born again Christians, evangelicals that really love the Bible, just like the New Testament Christians, the, right? The you know the early Christians, mm -hmm. they love the Word of God. Right, and they uh, quote it all over the place. A true born again Christian loves the Word of God. You right, can't, you can't get enough of it. You but, you love that. And so you're going to be like the Bereans mm -hmm. in, were in Acts 17. You know, they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures daily to see whether the things spoken of by Paul were true or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the biblical way of handling what a preacher says. You accept it if it flows with what the scripture teaches, but mm -hmm. you reject it if it doesn't against match it. up. Yeah. So Christians should love the Bible, read the Bible, follow the Bible. But we shouldn't think that we, uh, an individual Christian, shouldn't think that he himself is an errant and follow that. And Christian leaders uh, shouldn't present themselves as infallible or an errant because we all need to kind of um, check on each other. Yes. Every Protestant is their own pope isn't true. Every the Protestant's pastor is a pope shouldn't be true. <laughs> if it's true for some evangelicals, it shouldn't be. But then what if the Bible were our pope? We might have some disagreement on this. All right, so if the Bible, if we said the Bible is our Pope, not the, a Pope, well, there are actually a bunch of upsides to that. It doesn't require papal states to support it. it doesn't, the Bible doesn't require millions of dollars in upkeep. It doesn't tell us to persecute Jews or anybody else for that matter. If the Bible were our Pope, it wouldn't tell us we can skip purgatory by fighting and dying in a crusade against the Slavs in Eastern <laughs> Europe or anyone else. In fact, it doesn't even mention purgatory. For others who also believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, the Bible doesn't tell us to kill them, unlike some popes. The Bible won't get deposed, it won't get tried for heresy, or you won't have succession by killing it, unlike popes. All right, so God's word is sufficient. It teaches us truth better and, and, and better keeps us from error than the popes did. The popes only had two to seven ex cathedra statements. So for all these reasons, you would kind of think, well, actually, why don't we just say the Bible is our Pope because it's a much better Pope. However, <laughs> uh, I would say the Bible is really not, the, the, the role is not really our Pope because our ultimate authority is actually not the Bible. And it should not be the Bible. Our ultimate authority is God. Amen. It's worshiping Christ in spirit and truth. Right. Worshiping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as as we understand the concept of the Godhead through the Scripture, right. through the Word of God. But you're you're not worshiping and making an idol out of this book. Right. You're you're worshiping the actual living God who is there in mm -hmm. reality, and that's a that's a giant difference between you know my book here that's falling book. apart, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and the true and living God, the Creator of the who universe. never falls apart. <laughs> well, as long as I got this rubber band over here. Okay. okay. So, so while it could be thought of that, you know, the Bible is our Pope or the Bible is our ultimate thing. Actually, it's God. But the reason that the Bible is so important to us is because it's God's Word, and so that's I can understand why a Catholic like Keating could be confused and mistakenly think like the, the we think the Bible could be our Pope, but um, it's not. It, it, the, our, our, our Pope, if you can call it, call it that, is really Jesus. Um, and we don't need somebody under Jesus, contradicting Jesus, going behind Jesus, mm -hmm. giving a lousy example, contrary to Jesus. Uh, what we really need is Jesus. Amen. And one of the reasons we really go to the Word of God to understand God, because it's like you say, it's the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And when we read here, like in uh, Psalm 138, uh, verse 2b, the second half of uh, the verse 2 in, in Psalm 138 says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. So God is magnifying his word above all his name. Showing that that's how important God's word is to communicate His truth to His 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 people, mm -hmm. His, His, and that's why we, as His people, 
have to magnify God's word because if God's going to magnify what he has said through the power of the Holy Spirit, then, of course, we need to respect that Mm -hmm. and uh, understand that that's how important this word is, that God would magnify it above all his name, according to King James. Yeah, so so, so that's a good point. We just want to take God's word and understand it the way God tells us to. Amen, amen. Kind of going back to our roadmap again, why Catholics don't need a pope. Uh, after the introduction, we talked about the unfortunately horrible results of papal succession. There's no excuse for Christian leaders to do these things. Papal succession didn't do anything, good at least. Other churches did better without a Roman pope. Possible pope replacements, and we didn't really find any. We just need Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then finally, exactly where do we go from here? All right, so just kind of a quick summary. What the popes did and didn't do. Did any pope ever do anything good? Well, some may have done some good, but nothing that, you know, patriarchs and various other Christian leaders did good things too. They didn't have to be a pope to do that. But they did a lot of bad things, and they got away with it because they were pope. Okay, what about sola scriptura versus saying the scripture plus popes plus tradition versus God? And I'll go with God. <laughs> let, let, our, 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 our highest authority is God. But God's word, which is scripture, is more important than any of man's words, and they're not in the same plane at all, contrary to what Roman well, Catholicism says. particularly what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, particularly verses 1 through 9, where he's just blasting those Pharisees mm-hmm. for replacing the commands of God with the traditions of men. Right. And now the Roman Catholic traditions are, are different traditions, but they're still replacing them with traditions of men. Exactly. So if we say, let's just go with God, and let's just go with Scripture, uh, we have some issues here which Catholics bring up and we need to address. Who's going to interpret the Bible? And then another thing we'll talk about, Keating claims that the pre-Nicene church was Catholic. Then we'll talk about the importance of taking seriously your faith in God and what you're to do. All right, so let's just kind of summarize. The popes set some horrible examples and commanded terrible things, and they had bad teaching, though the Catholic Church won't necessarily call those official, but they won't admit it, that's fine. The popes did not deny certain doctrines, such as the virgin birth, Jesus dying for our sins, two were rebellion though. Churches without popes were kept from doing many evil things that a church with a pope did. The pope only made two, and some argue a few more, pronouncements that the Catholic Church now calls ex cathedra, and popes made many pronouncements that were official in their time, but got unofficialized. Remember Celestine V? Okay, so E2 sola scriptura, or scripture plus popes plus tradition versus God. And Keating claims it was the church that formed the Bible, not the Bible that formed the church. This is from uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, page 312. Okay, one, I don't think the church formed the Bible. Two, I don't think the Bible formed the church either. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit formed the church. The Holy Spirit breathed into the uh, prophets and apostles is God breathed scripture, still having their personality, but have that. So, you know, reading what Keating is, he's saying, is it A or B or is it B or A? And I'd say neither, it's C. You know, uh, it's like, what does God have to do with this? It seems like nothing, (laughs) you know, from Keating's viewpoint. And with us, it's everything. Okay, you often hear that Protestants base their authority in the Bible and Catholics on the Bible plus popes plus tradition in some kind of order. Uh, but no, we don't think the Bible is our highest authority. Our highest authority is God it's because it's God's word. Okay, so the next problem, who's going to interpret the Bible? Okay, well, I'll tell you one thing, the Pope doesn't do it. I mean, with only two to six or seven statements, he hadn't officially said anything. Not Next only that, in my debate with uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Fastigi, mm-hmm. the, the head of the philosophy department at the St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas, it was a two-hour debate I took with him. People see it there on the screen. Check it out for yourself. But anyway, I asked him during that debate, I said, how many verses of the Bible has the Roman Catholic Church actually interpreted with infallibility? Mm-hmm. You know what he said? What? Six or seven, I'm not quite sure. Hmm. And I'm going, six or seven verses is the only thing you can authoritatively interpret out of this whole this whole book. Right. In fact, I had this Bible with me at that debate. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, who needs that? 
we want to know everything that the Word of God yeah. has to say. Keating actually brings up Revelation 13, about which is one of the more difficult passages to interpret, how Protestants have all different views on what that means. Mm-hmm. But Keating didn't tell us what the right answer was. He didn't tell us the official infallible Catholic teaching was because there isn't any. That's it. That's why I didn't tell it to you. So it's like, you know, it, whatever the answer is for who's going to interpret the Bible, it, it, after, you know, 1,500 years or whatever, is not the Pope. The uh, Pope didn't do it. All right. So how do we interpret the Bible? Well, one of the best books for interpreting the Bible is the Bible itself. <laughs> uh, a lot of times, that you know, various passages will speak on other passages or the similar topics, and you can see that. Uh, the other thing, you can look at past Christian writers of commentaries, past and current, and study notes and other works, so you can see what other Christians say. Now, does this have the certainty of infallible teachings? Well, no, because they can be mistaken, and we kind of all need each other. But then if you only got two to six or seven statements, you know, the Pope didn't give any in, in, infallible teachings significantly anyway. Mm-hmm. All right? Uh, church councils and tradition, they sometimes contradicted each other. Okay? So what I believe for the ultimate answer, who's going to interpret the Bible, is I believe the church, and I say capital C, but I don't mean the Catholic Church, I don't mean an evangelical church, I mean all Christians in all times, I think have collectively understood the Bible as well as they needed, at least at that time. I talked about 1,121, except that number isn't quite right, it's I'm sure a little higher now, uh, teachings that I have found um, that Christians prior to Nicaea that would agree with, and every teaching that I found, except for about, oh, around uh, 11 or so, uh, that we would say they messed up on, uh, Christians would agree with today, and there are about 20 teachings that Christians disagree on. Uh, so one teaching they messed up on, for example, is there's this uh, myth of a phoenix bird that every thousand years uh, burns itself in fire and then resurrects from the dead. And so in nature, um, that was an example of, uh, of death and resurrection. Well, that all sounds nice, except there really is no phoenix bird that does that. That's right. So the early Christians got that one wrong. So that's, you know, that's one wrong. There are about eight or nine others wrong. Um, so you know, they weren't perfect, uh, but they were pretty good. And, and if you only went by early Christian uh, writers, it's like you wouldn't be perfect, but you wouldn't be too far off. Uh, well, another reason true born-again Christians understand the Word of God and they recognize it when they see it is mm-hmm. because they have that super, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit within them. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what being born again is all about that Jesus was talking about in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. You must be born again in order to even see the kingdom of God. And I remember when I got born again, I still remember the night and the hour, the mm-hmm. whole bit back on May 16, 1981, when I was born again. Okay. That's a supernatural event. Right. And and so for the rest of your natural living life, you, you're you not by yourself. You've got the Spirit with you. Uh and as it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17, how the Holy Spirit, uh, con- con- you know, convinces our spirit that we are the sons of God. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you're in communion with God all day, all night, uh, and you're convicted of your sins by the power of the Holy Spirit. All these things that the Scripture talks about, uh, the power of the Spirit. Uh, so that helps a true Christian understand what's false and true, and it gives you the understanding you need. Not total, because that's why there's evangelists and teachers and, mm-hmm. and pastors and all that to help you with the understanding. But uh, that also promotes your living the Christian life and your true worship to God, mm-hmm. because you're in communion with the Holy Spirit who's within you. Your yeah. body is the temple of Amen. the Holy Spirit. That's a great point. Because uh, we have the Holy Spirit to help us. We, now, sometimes we can get it wrong because we we're not infallible ourselves. But if someone didn't have the Holy Spirit, they weren't born again, I could sort of understand why they'd say we must have a Pope or somebody else to interpret for us because we have no clue. Well, with the Holy Spirit, you do have a clue. But getting back to all these teachings, even after Nicaea, Athanasius, who wasn't perfect, but he affirmed not 595 of them, so if you just went with the early Christian writers and Athanasius, you know, you'd still be, you know, not too bad. So, so now Keating says something that we've talked about before in other videos. He claims the pre-Nicene church was Catholic. Keating's incorrect. Uh, unless you say Catholic, 
means you can be Catholic without a Roman Pope, without papal infallibility, no Mariolatry, no saint veneration, no purgatory, no indulgences, no Pope over everything. That doesn't sound very Catholic to me, but if he calls that Catholic, okay. And then now the early church did have bishops, and they did believe this thing called um, apostolic succession, not papal succession. They believed that the bishops, like multiple bishops, could be descended from an apostle, you know, because they were ordained by the apostle. So they did believe that. Um, they believed in the authority of scripture. They also believed in the authority of, of bishops. Uh, no Roman bishop was called Pope until the local synod of Arles in 314 AD, a year after Constantine legalized Christianity. The next reference is 347 AD to anyone in Rome being called a bishop. And no Roman bishop called himself a pope until Pope Sericius in 384 to 399 AD. So as a Catholic, you have to decide, is it about the church or is it about God? And so I would say your next step is to take seriously your faith in God. If you want to be a Catholic, then be serious about your faith in God. I don't mean be serious about your faith in the pope, the faith in the Catholic church or the saints, but faith in God. Uh, many Catholics, including Gary Wells and Keating, they are very preoccupied with Pope Francis and what he's saying, where he's ambiguous, where he's not, if he's good, if he's not. And I would almost say, eh, don't worry about it. Blow him off. <laughs> I, I'm not worried what the top Buddhist or Hindu you know, spiritual leaders say. Why should I be worried about Pope Francis? Yeah. I'll, I'll just go with uh, my leader, Jesus. If you are serious about God, then study God's word above all human words. Now, in the Bible, in Scripture, it teaches us to loyally obey God's shepherds over you. As Hebrew 13, 17 says, So it would be loyal to be a rebel. Well, the Bible teaches us to be loyal. But the Bible also teaches us to be a rebel. Be a rebel against evil. Titus 1, 14 says, Pay no attention to the commands of those who turn away from the truth. And 2 Timothy 3, 15 says to avoid evil people. Okay, so that includes evil people which Pope today claimed papal succession from. That's correct. And if you've got a priest that's a pedophile or any of that kind of stuff that goes on that we've heard about in the news. Don't follow him. <laughs> exactly. They've already proven by... In yeah. fact, Jesus even said it in Matthew chapter 7. He, mm -hmm. he, he said, you'll know them by their fruits. Mm -hmm. You know, he's talking about good fruit, bad fruit. And then he goes on to talk about take the, the narrow way, not the broad, broad road that leads to destruction. And many there be that follow that, that road. you got to go the narrow way and few there be that find it. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on to talk about people that claim to be Christians right after that. And he's saying, uh, Lord, Lord, didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? And didn't right. we do this, that, and the other? And is it going to turn out good for those people just because they're claiming this? Jesus says, I never knew you. And, and why is that? Because of their works. They, yeah. You could tell that they didn't love God Yeah. because they didn't want to do what God said. Depart from me, you evildoers. Yeah. Amen. So what are you to do? Uh, pray to God that he is your first love, not anything or anyone on earth, even a church. Put God first, not your ambitions, your pleasures, your traditions, or even your church. So we would ask that you would just turn over your life to, to God not to your pope, not to your priest, not to your church, not to your pastor. And if you just ask Jesus to come into your heart and that you would be born again and that the Holy Spirit would direct you and then get involved with a, with a Bible-believing ministry, you know, with, with people who, who, who really follow God and want to follow God's word over tradition, be it Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, or any tradition, who follow God uh, more than anything else and grow and we need to live the Christian life together. Christians all different backgrounds and we just ask that you would pray to God that make him the Lord of your life and you know we don't have a pope per se we have a king and that king is Jesus. Amen amen and remember this uh, when the apostles were preaching and going about and they told that Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 when the jailer got all nervous and he realizes uh, these guys must really be from God. Mm -hmm. And he goes, what must, sirs, what must I do to be saved? See, their response to him on that question totally destroys the whole 
the whole setup of the Roman Catholic Church and their popes and everything else they've got. It just destroyed it because all they said to him was, they didn't say, well, go find a Roman Catholic Church and do and, 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 and do what the Pope tells you and the, and the cardinals and the priests. They didn't say that. It goes back to what Steve was just talking about. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. <laughs> now, is that some complicated seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church that you might, perhaps might be saved? You know, if you do do the sacraments and get water baptized, all this stuff, right? Uh, they didn't say that. It says, believe on mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's, it's Jesus. It's believing what Jesus said in his word and, 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 and calling out to him in faith and repentance, believing on his name. That's where you become a true Christian, by being born again, as Jesus said in John chapter 3. So that's, it, it goes right back to what Steve was just saying. That's where salvation is found. It's not in some man-made church or tradition or, or some pope. It's on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on him and thou shalt be saved. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's Jesus, not the Roman Catholic Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses at the Kingdom Hall, Mormonism, Islam, or any of this stuff. It's Jesus, King Jesus. Mm -hmm. Believe on his name and thou shalt be saved. Well, with that, I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm Larry Wessels for Christian Answers with our Director of Research for Christian Answers, Steve Morrison. Steve, great job, great, great. research. It's uh, amazing how much effort and work you put into this kind of research to make the make make early church history and everything else a lot easier because mm -hmm. you do the research we mm -hmm. we don't have to but you give enough references where if someone really wants to find out if what you were saying is true mm -hmm. the information's there you, know, you just go look it up especially in this internet age uh, where you can just click a button and find stuff hit a link but anyway with that thank you for joining us today for this program uh for christian answers presents join us again next time God bless you all. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our C Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.